subgenres of subgenres of subgenres of subgenres. When will it ever end? Some people like being able to describe music in more highly specific terms and find the more labels, the easier it is to find music that meets their preferences. Other people kind of find it confusing or nitpicky and they just wish people would just knock it off with the additional subgenres. For the second group of people, I have bad news. In this video, I am going to make up some new possible subgenre labels. Obviously, I'm one person, I can't make these happen, and maybe they're bad ideas, maybe they shouldn't happen. Maybe I need to like not be trying to name other new subgenres. But I figure, why not make a video on it? I find most of these labels that I've came up with helpful in actual conversations. Sometimes you really do just need to be able to more specifically describe things. So I figured, why not share them? Let the audience, people watching this video, decide whether they like them, they dislike them, whether they feel like it's just the name that's dumb. Maybe it needs a name change. So if you're watching this video and you like an idea, dislike it, feel like it needs tweaking, please leave a comment. I like having feedback on my videos, not just to see how I'm doing, but because I'm really interested in what other people have to say about this. So to get started, I'm going to start with the first sub sub genre on the list which is kind of the one that inspired this whole concept for a video and it's called dethereal so as you can kind of tell from the name it's got the word death and ethereal death referring to death rock so it's kind of that middle ground between ethereal and death rock and now some people might be thinking but those sound like total opposites on like the whole spectrum and at first glance you might think that but there are some bands that really like edge in between those two. So the like, idea for this originally came from when I was like on the internet talking about music and I hear a lot of people calling Mephisto Walls ethereal. And I kind of found it puzzling at first because I always thought of Mephisto Walls as a death rock band. They had like former members of Christian Death, that's where their roots were in. But as I kind of listened to their music I could think, yeah there kind of is an ethereal sound here too. And I noticed it doesn't just apply to Mephisto Walls. There are other bands that have a kind of similar sound to this. Not a ton of bands, but there's at least a good handful. So for example, bands this might apply to besides Mephisto Walls would be Stone 588, That Croic Mirror. The first album of The Shroud, later on they kind of moved on to more ethereal or your dark wavy stuff, but their first album like has some very strong Dina Cancer vibes in some of the songs. And unlike the more punky end, Madre Del Vizio. So you'll notice like most of these bands are from California where Death Rock originated. And most of them were from in round in the early 90s. So this is kind of like a sound that was in a specific time and place mostly outside of Madre Del Vizio which I think it's a combination between Italian and German members. But when you look at the history of the sub sub genre, that kind of makes a little bit of sense. So where this originated from was the band Christian Death. So most people know only Theater of Pain. They released quite a few other albums after that. I did a whole tier list of Christian Death albums if you wanna learn more about the details of that. But pretty much their fourth album, Atrocities, which was the first one without Roz, it was, I believe it was recorded in Europe. But yeah, it featured Barry Galvin playing guitar. And if you know of Barry Galvin, he's in Mephisto Walls, he's in, I'm sorry, what other band? It's on the tip of my tongue. Scarlet's Remains, yes, yeah, sorry. He kind of has this distinctive guitar style. It's kind of distorted and a little bit punky, but it's also like very highly affected and atmospheric at the same time. So it's a very distinct guitar style that kind of like edges between, it's like in that middle ground between ethereal and death rock. So he kind of like pioneered that sound on Christian Death's Atrocities album. So when C left Christian Death, they didn't sound the same afterwards. They kind of moved on in other directions. But he took his sound with him to his band Mephisto Walls. So like the early years of Mephisto Walls, it was a male-fronted band. 
throughout most of the 80s. Most of the stuff that was in the 80s was not actually released originally then. It's like on like modern compilations of old stuff. But during the early 90s, he got a new singer, Christiana. And although for ethereal music, you don't have to have female vocals, like there can definitely be male vocals in ethereal music. I feel like when Christiana kind of like joined the band, that's where people started thinking, hmm, this kind of sounds more like ethereal. And they started grouping it in more with that. And obviously there's like bands with, again, bands with similar sound. Stone 588 and Dichroic Mirror kind of have a similar -ish sound. I think either one or both members of Dichroic Mirror were in Stone 588 for that matter. And again, The Shroud, I think they're from California as well. So they're like product of the same sort of scene. All this was like happening in like early 90s California, with the exception again, Madre del Vizio, who were in like Italy and Germany, who Christian death was probably popular there too, and they might have just been influenced a lot by Christian death's Atrocities album. Okay, so for the next subgenre. So this one, I was originally going to call it like mom bands, but I realized that that kind of is only applies to a very specific age group. So like people who are older than me, they're not going to be like mom bands. They're probably going to be like childhood nostalgia bands. Or for people younger than me, they might be a little bit too old to be mom bands. They might be edging on grandma bands. But yeah, these are the kind of bands that you would hear on like a John Watt. Not John Waters. What's that guy's name? I'm going to stop recording here. So the next subgenre I'm going to talk about, this kind of represents the more melodic side of 80s goth bands. I was originally going to call it mom bands, since it kind of something I'd associate with like moms listening to, but I realized that's kind of not a universal label. So maybe for someone my age, it might be something I might associate with my mom listening to, but for people older than me, it's more like childhood nostalgia. Or for people younger than me, it's kind of pushing grandma music. But then I kind of realized a much better label. So like one of my dis things I would use to like describe these bands, it's like, it's the kind of stuff you'd hear in a John Hughes movie, or you might see in like the poster of like Ferris Bueller's room or something. So if you don't know who John Hughes is, he's like pretty successful, I think like writer, producer, director, or something like that. He kind of like worked on some well-known movies, like some of the National Lampoon movies, Home Alone. More importantly, like what's kind of known now is like the Brat Pack movies, like Sixteen Candles, St. Elmo's Fire, Pretty in Pink, all that kind of stuff. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is the one I'm more familiar with. So in like in a lot of these bands, it kind of like had like a specific aesthetic to the soundtrack. Kind of 80s, kind of post-punk, but also kind of like accessible. So a lot of these bands that would fall in this category, they were actually in John Hughes movies. So Flesh for Lulu, March Violets, Gene Loves Jezebel were all in John Hughes films. Flesh for Lulu and Gene Loves Jets and March Violets were in some kind of wonderful specifically. And there's some other bands that were in John Hughes movies as well, like Lords of the New Church and Killing Joke were in Weird Science. I don't really feel like they count for the most part. Both of those bands, I think, had more melodic material as well. But I kind of associate them more with like the artier side of post-punk or the more aggressive side. But yeah, so like examples of some of these bands, whether they're in John Hughes movies or not, would include like Balam and the Angel, Gene Loves Jezebel, The Bolshoi, Flesh for Lulu, Rose of Avalanche. They, a lot of them kind of like have like a more like mainstream friendly sound. They're a little bit more straight up rock. They're a little bit more pop friendly. With some of them, they were originally were rooted a lot more in goth and they kind of moved elsewhere as they kind of progressed, which is the case with Gene Loves Jezebel and Flesh for Lulu specifically. And as for why I find this kind of a useful label, well, these are kind of the bands you could like put in like a mainstream 80s night and not chase people off the dance floor like you would with like Lords of the New Church, Killing Joke. They're kind of like a 
if you're trying to have like a goth event that's more accessible and you want to like appeal to like people with 80s nostalgia, they might be good bands to play. Show that like goth isn't all necessarily just like underground dark stuff. Some of it was in really popular movies. Okay, so the last subgenre I'm gonna talk about is Onkwave. Onkwave is a term I did not come up with myself. It was originally used by ITAC slash Elitist Joe, who like has a YouTube channel, does memes on Facebook, writes for Cemetery Confessions. I think he originally used it on Discord as just like a joke term. But when I kind of heard it, it just clicked as like a good description for like a very specific style of 2000s dark wave that was really popular at the time. So the name Onkwave kind of comes from a lot of these bands sort of like had like onks on their album covers, like Cruise Shadows, Mystery of the Whisper, or you might like see like desert vibes in the music video or sort of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia themes. And like, just like onks used to be kind of popular, but aren't anymore. These bands are kind of like the same way. I feel like they're kind of more popular back when onks were more popular in the scene. So some example bands would include Cruise Shadows, Last Dance, Ego Likeness, etc. I feel like the real progenitor of this though was London After Midnight. I kind of talked about it them in my 10 bands that represented the 90s, but London After Midnight kind of pioneered a new style that was sort of more heavy on the distorted lead guitars and more like electronic music types of synths or realistic instrument sounds rather than the more like 80s sounding synths of previous bands. So I'm not sure if most of these bands would necessarily cite London After Midnight as a big influence, but I can kind of hear it in their sound. One thing I'm not sure of is whether I should kind of include Switchblade Symphony and bands influenced by them into this as well. Because although Switchblade Symphony has like some elements of this sound, they aren't quite as driven by guitar leads. They're more like of a distorted rhythm guitar in their sound. So like compared to like goth bands from the 80s, modern listeners might think this is like really far removed from this. It's the kind of thing that probably happened more out of evolution rather than direct inspiration. So a lot of these people were part of the scene. They like liked a lot of goth bands, but they also liked a lot of other stuff as well. So in a lot of these bands, you might hear influences from various types of electronic music, like industrial, drum and bass, uh, trip hop, etc. that you'll kind of like see interspersed with like the goth rock guitar sound. As for why I find this label kind of helpful, well, part of it's kind of like a joke. This is not like a knock against any of these bands. Some of them are pretty good bands. It's more of just kind of like describe a sound that's like I really associate with like a specific time period, the 2000s, that kind of just don't really hear anymore. I mean, a lot of these bands are still around, but you don't hear new bands forming in this style. It's very much product of its time. And I, I feel like it's kind of like a sort of in joke. Like if you were around then you kind of like know what I'm talking about a little bit. If you weren't, you might be kind of confused. But if you are kind of confused about what I'm talking about, look up some of these bands and listen to it. And you can tell me whether you think I'm like onto something kind of describing it as its almost own sort of sub style. So I'd love to hear viewer thoughts on this video as well. Do you feel like some of these subgenres are accurate or helpful to use? Or do you feel like I've mostly just been spouting nonsense this whole time? Are there any like labels you think would be better words to use for some of these than the ones I came up with? I'd love to hear that as well. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. I always enjoy being able to read them. And just to, for any bands that may be watching this who have been named in this video, I want to emphasize this is not like meant to make fun of or knock against any of these bands. Most of the bands that I've mentioned in here are bands that I like. And like there's no bands I hate in here that I'm like making fun of either. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, like and subscribe for more content because I'm planning on making more videos, both videos like this and probably other ideas as well.
And now I also have like some social media accounts for people to follow if they're interested. I have a Facebook like page and an Instagram account, both also illustration links that you can follow for updates on the channel or for like other st stuff I might choose to post on there. So that's all I have for this video, but I will see people in the next one because I'm definitely planning on making another one. So bye everyone.